to the book of Amos. We read Amos 4. You can find that on page 810 in your pew Bibles. At Redeemer, we've been going through this book of Amos together. And I believe I've preached one sermon here, the introduction to Amos, Amos chapter 1, through a few verses in chapter 2. Today we jump ahead a little bit in the book of Amos to Amos 4. Amos chapter 4, we'll read the entire chapter. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who are on the mountain of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, bring wine, let us drink. The Lord God has sworn by his holiness, behold, the days shall come upon you when he shall take you away with fish hooks, your posterity with fish hooks. You shall go through broken walls, each one straight ahead of her. You will be cast into Harmon, says the Lord. Come to Bethel and transgress. At Gilgal, multiply transgression. Bring your sacrifices every morning and your tithes every three days. Offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving with leaven. Proclaim and announce the freewill offerings for this you love, you children of Israel, says the Lord God. Also, I gave you cleanness of teeth in all your cities and lack of bread in all your places, yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. I also withheld rain from you when there were still three months to the harvest. I made it rain on one city. I withheld rain from another city. One part was rained upon, and where it did not rain, the part withered. So two or three cities wandered to another city to drink water, but they were not satisfied. Yet, have, yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. I blasted you with blight and mildew when your gardens increased, your, your vineyards, your fig trees, and your olive trees. The locusts devoured them. Yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. I sent among you a plague after the manner of Egypt. Your young men I killed with a sword along with your captive horses. I made the stench from your camps come up into your nostrils. Yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. I overthrew some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and you were like a firebrand plucked from the burning. Yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. Therefore, thus will I do to you, O Israel, because I will do this to you. Prepare to meet your God, O Israel. For behold, he who forms the mountains and creates the wind, who declares to man what his thought is and makes the morning darkness, who treads the high places of the earth, the Lord God of hosts is his name. Congregation, let's come before our God. Let's sing a song of, of preparation, number 230, singing of God's holiness, singing together, holy, holy, holy. Holy, number 230.
Congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, the text for, for this morning's sermon is this entire chapter of Amos 4. Congregation, have you ever heard the complaints about the church? Unbelievers who, who grow up in the church, they, they might describe the church as a, a type of club, a, a gathering of hypocrites, they might say, who take a religion like a a set of modern-day Pharisees. They describe uh, the church often as a a people, a people who are at times wealthy, even wealthy, they say, through shrewd dealings. A people, they say, have taken advantage of others whose religion is, is greed. And sadly, unbelievers are not the only ones who speak this way of people in the church even those who've moved on from one congregation to another are often the worst offenders speaking against God's people. It's a habit. It's often difficult to break, and it causes great unrest in the church of Christ. And at times, these observations actually might be on point. Of course, the church is a place where sinners come together. Sinners come and, and worship, and we're sinners come, there is certainly to be sin as well, and of course that is true, but where there is the godly, there ought to also be forgiveness, there, there should be grace and repentance and faith, isn't that also true? I say these things because the church today can have a, a reputation as being fat and proud, much like the, the the church in, in Israel's day, these, these Israelites that we've read about in the passage, whether a stereotype is true or partly true or completely outrightly false, our God confronts us today in this passage with His providence. You see, our, our holy God calls us to prepare to meet Him. And in this, we see His holiness, we see His grace before us, and His mercy The text is about God's work in His people. He's not idly standing by waiting for them to get their lives together. He's actively calling out to them, gathering them together. God makes use of general revelation, calling His people through creation, through through His providence in the world. And He also makes use of special revelation as well, sending this man Amos to Him, sending this passage to us this morning. This text calls us to prepare to meet our holy Lord of hosts, and it does so by calling our attention to God's holiness in Bashan, to Bethel's transgression, and finally to God's calls of repentance. First, see his his holiness in Bashan. You see, Amos is continuing his prophecy against the people who lived in Samaria. You can read of that in in chapter 3 and in chapter 2 as well. For chapter 3 has closed with a prophecy concerning the great houses in Samaria. The great houses there would cease. The prosperity of of the surrounding areas before the people in this text as well. Hear this word, begins Amos, calling our attention once again to the one who speaks as as the lion who cries out, roaring from Jerusalem. Amos calls our attention once again. Yet here he's seeking the ear of of a particular audience, a people that he calls the cows of Bashan. And the ones that that he has in mind are not literal cows or cattle living in that valley of Bashan. Bashan, you might remember, is is a lush uh, farm land on the Yarmouth River, a place that Amos refers to there was highly sought after land. In Numbers 32, the wealthy tribes wanted this for themselves because they knew that when they raised cattle there, they would have that grade A beef. They would have the the choicest of farmland. Well, Amos calls out to the the cows of Bashan, but not the literal cattle that would have been on those fields. 
For look what he says about them. He says, who are on the mountain of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, bring that we might drink. These are women. These are women who lived in Samaria. They're wealthy women. They oppress. They, they crush the needy indirectly. They did it, you see, through, through their husbands. Don't underestimate the force of a, a persuasive wife, says one commentator. They, they nagged their men to go and get that they might continue to drink, that they might continue to, to live in luxury, no doubt living in those houses that were described at the end of, of chapter 3. They have the excess, like those, those cattle in the fields. They, they enjoy the prosperity of the land. Amos uses the language as well of cows, not oxen. Notice that. Other prophets will speak of, of women as oxen in other passages. Perhaps you have a note in your study Bible concerning that. But here Amos employs a visual agricultural analogy of cows. Cows, for they're unbridled. They're not yoked. They eat to their full, wandering around from grassland to grassland, grazing. And they seem to be unsatisfied as well. as they, they say to their husbands to go get more, not for a necessity, but for luxury. There's an irony in the text that doesn't show up so well here as well. Husband could be translated as Lord. It could be translated as, as master. They call out to the authority over them, commanding them to go, you see. There's a, a reversal here similar to that which we find in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. Eve gave to her husband at her temptation, right? Adam sinned. One commentator suggests in similar fashion that if the devil has a nasty tactic by attacking men through their wives. He says perhaps if, if the devil came to the man outrightly, he might refuse he might stay away from the devil's attacks, but the devil can get at him through his wife. Many a man will fall. Many a man will fall through her discontented heart. That is true. Even, even in our lives, we can see powerful men submitting to their, to their wives as they pressure them more and more. And this, of course, is still the fault of these, of these men, these authorities. Of course it is. The blame is still rightly upon them. But the point is, as well, to be, to be choosy about who one marries. The point is to be vigilant, as well, in our, in our marriages. And it calls women to take stock, as well, of their, of their hearts that can become discontent chasing their husbands for more and more, pressuring them at the expense of others, forcing him, as it were, to commit crimes, for she wants more. The spoiled Samaritan darlings in the text here oppressed and pillaged the needy through their husbands that they might indulge more in the blessings that are found within the area there. And so God calls them to hear him. He calls out those who have done these deeds. He, he calls out and he makes a vow. Look at verse 2. He says, The Lord has sworn by his holiness that behold, the days are coming upon you and they shall take you away with hooks. The Lord swears on his holiness. And what is particularly interesting is that he swears by his holiness, not his love. Not his justice, his holiness. His holiness is what's placed before us in the passage. Holiness, you see, is something other, something set apart, something differentiated from something else. Just as Israel was to be a holy nation that is separated and distinguished from the other nations around them, so too God is holy. God is something other. He's separate, actually distinguished from all of creation. 
There's none like him. He is holy, holy, holy. Isaiah says in chapter 6, 3, speaking of, of the seraphim before the Lord, crying out, holy, holy, holy. And that's why we sang that hymn together as our song of preparation. What we mean is that God is holy other. He's sharply distinguished from his creation. He is a simple spiritual being. He is, he is holy. He is different. His holiness reflects the fact that God will not tolerate sin. He is perfect in his demands. He is the same for those, and he demands the same, rather, for those who share his presence. This is why his temple had a holy of holies for his dwelling. That separated his, his dwelling from that of men, teaching us that for sinners to, to come into the presence of God, they must be purified. He requires perfection, you see, to be in his presence. Therefore, God's holiness demands that sinners be separated, be, be distinguished for his tolerance. His holiness cannot tolerate sin. God's holiness also redeems them by calling them holy. That is separate. That is righteous. They are to reflect his holiness, being distinguished from the people around them. They are to, to live as obedient people, living as a nation of priests. Amos, audience, they've not lived a holy life. And therefore, he swears by his holiness concerning them. They shall be taken from his presence, those who are not holy. They shall not be permitted near our God. Look at what, what Amos refers to here. Verse 2 and 3, he swears on his holiness that these women will be carried away. And Amos employs this imagery of fishing. With fish hooks, they'll be dragged through the breaches. Some of Israel's enemies we know used hooks, putting them through the lips of their captors to drag them and, and lead them away into captivity. Not a, not a nose ring that might be used on, on a cow or a piece of cattle. No, the figurative language here is more literal, actually, for the implement used by Israel's enemies. This is something that would actually happen to a large number of Samaritans, Israelites, and Jews as they're carried away, pulling them through those breaches, denotes a, a captivity, a destruction of the walls, a destruction of the defenses. The gates wouldn't even need to be used by these captors. They'd be able to drag them through the holes in the walls, dragged off to Harmon. Now, no one knows exactly where Harmon is. Could be a fortress in Babylon. It could be a place far away. We're not entirely sure. The point is that they would be taken away. Like fish taken from the sea, they would be hooked and, and dragged from their once secure places of dwelling, from their prosperity, their perceived safety, the holiness of of God would accomplish this and would be on full display as he will not tolerate this injustice. Such disorder in the homes, such a society breakdown at large, the oppression of the people for the, for the high dining social class. Another reason is given for God's anger towards his people as well. The second reason is given in verses 4 and 5. Amos employs a, an irony as he invites us to go to Bethel. Look at the text. It says, Come to Bethel and transgress. At Gilgal, multiply transgression. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three days. The irony is that God is not actually inviting people to come and sin. What is being shown actually here is their religious practice. Their, their intent, for they were a very devout people, religious in every way, sincerely bringing sacrifices and bringing their tithes. 
every three days, it says. Not only the unleavened bread, but also the leavened. Not only once a week or once every few weeks, but every three days they brought their tithes. Notice what isn't in their worship, though. There's no guilt offering here. There's no sin offering. These are fellowship offerings. They're sacrifices of, of thanksgiving. But there's no acknowledgement of guilt. There's no acknowledgement of sin. Where there is no sin, you know there is no repentance. Where there is no sin, no, no repentance, there's no need of a mediator, there's no need of a savior, there's no perception of guilt. Then there's no returning in, in faith and repentance. And likely these, these verses here is an exaggeration, it's a charge against their religious convictions, their practice, for they were piously religious, even if this is overstated. They were sincere. They were, they were convinced, and they sacrificed, and, and they tithed. Yet they did so incorrectly at Bethel, where those golden calves were set up. The people's hearts were far from God as worshipers. They actually were idolaters. They worshipped a carved image, a, a golden calf. They gave and gave. They published their offerings. They made a big deal about worship. A very religious, a very sincere, a very committed people publishing the gifts that they gave, much like the Pharisees who, who tithed as well from an empty heart. The Pharisees' theology was alive and well in the time of Amos, just as it is in our day as well. And look, there's, there's nothing wrong with being devoted to worship. The problem let's get this clear, is their idolatry. It's the fact that they're putting their trust in their own actions. They, they had faith in themselves and in their false gods. The problem is they're seeking their own glory. They're building up their own name as they publish these works abroad. And so God calls attention to their idolatry, to their false worship, their hearts that are set against Him. And the danger... The danger is that people who, who think they have it all together can fall into these types of habits. They don't see that, that they need to change. They, they don't look to God anymore. They're not humble. They're not teachable. They come increasingly in the context of, of their idolatry. They're even secure in their false worship. And such can be the temptation today as well. So God's holiness comes like Jesus in the temple courts, overturning those tables of the money changers, calling out to his people to repent and worship him rightly. God's holiness comes before the people of Israel through Amos here. And it's likely that Israel would have heard this and responded very much in the same way Israel responded in the days of Jesus, confronted with his holiness his own people were upset. Remember when Jesus overturned those money tables, their, their system, their, their commerce. Confrontation with a holy God demands humility from his people. They must be ready to, to hear of what they're doing wrong in worship. They must be ready and willing to revise their methods. Look, it starts in their hearts. It starts in their hearts because if these people's hearts were right with God, there would be no need for Bethel. There would be no need for those golden calves, for no one would serve them. But in God's grace, He doesn't leave them in their idolatry. Look at the way He deals with His people. He, he calls them to repentance before Him. As busy as they have been in their idolatry and in their worship, as committed as they are, to that type of worship, God is far more committed to bringing them out and bringing them to himself. For he has been busy. He has been busy in his creation calling them to repentance. Look at the list given of God's providences. These are, these are ordinary things given to us. Rain, rain on, on one crop and lack of rain on another. 
sun over there in that man's field, and, and shade over there, crops in one field, and, and drought in another. All this to get them to repent. See what he does? His, his acts in creation, they're, they're regular. They're, they're providential ways to show that he is still in control. He is still governing the creation. He refers to health, to, to daily bread. He refers to withholding rain and drought, sending it on one city. God points to bumper crops in one place and, and dead fields in another. One city has water and another city has none and the population has to go there, from there, to, to the city with water to, to get it. We have mildew and locusts eating and rotting a harvest, pestilence reminding them of the days when God sent the plagues upon Egypt. Kills their young men with the sword, carrying away horses, a stench in the camps, and so forth. He calls their attentions to, to his actions in Sodom and Gomorrah. The fact that they've been spared from that. They've been plucked out like a brand. All this with the refrain that continues to be repeated. Yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. Yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. What must he do to turn their hard hearts, we ask? What must he do to remind them that he is still in control, that they are his people living in grace before him? What must he do to cause them to turn in repentance and faith and to live before him rightly? What must he do to you and I to remind us of these things? What must he do for us to see and praise him for his majesty, for his holiness, for his providence? What must he do to show us his power and his control, causing us to turn our stubborn hearts in repentance and faith and worship and in fear? What does it take to strike the fear of God in the face of his people, to make us turn from our wickedness? So he says he'll do these things to them. He'll, he'll treat them like Sodom and Gomorrah, as Egypt. His judgment is coming upon them. Then he says, prepare to meet your God. His power, his majesty is before them as well as he proves his omnipotence, his, his all-powerful attributes. He says, behold, he who forms the mountain sand, creates the wind, declares to man what is his thought, who makes the morning darkness and treads on the heights of the earth. The Lord God of hosts is his name. And we respond begging for mercy this morning. Prepare to meet your God is terrifying. He sets himself against the sinner. His holiness, his, his power is placed before them. It's a sobering, a, a fearful thought of sinners coming before such might, such power. A holy, holy, holy being. Like Isaiah, we cry out as well, knowing we are a people of unclean lips, a people of unclean lives. Like Isaiah, who had the, the cherubim come down and place a coal to his lips, there's mercy in this text too. Look in history as God deals with his people. Surely he sent an army to drag them out of Israel. He sent sinful men with their armies and their tools of destruction the chariots came, the battering rams came, the scaffolds came and overcame those walls. God sent them with hooks to snag his people and drag them off to captivity. God sent them. They were acting according to the desires, to their own desires, and God let them have reign over his people. Prepare to meet your God is the refrain. But God was not Nebuchadnezzar. God wasn't the Babylonians who came. Prepare to meet your God. He came not with sword and sickle in his hand. He came as a baby born in Bethlehem. God came, the voice of grace, mercy, and peace. 
proclaiming and, and calling them to faith and repentance before him. He called them and offered them a way through the way, the truth, and the life to be redeemed and to be welcomed in the presence of a holy God. Prepare to meet your God. You see, God comes, like here too, He, he comes calling His people, preparing them for repentance and faith. God, our God, is the gracious one. He's the patient one. He's the just, the holy one. Prepare to meet your God. You see, there came a day when God suffered the punishments due according to the righteous requirements of His holiness. There came a day when, when Jesus died, that atoning sacrifice that you and I might meet God in peace that our, our meeting wouldn't require His wrath, that, that you and I, sinners in every way, deserving of the punishment spoken of here, that we could prepare to meet our God in peace and grace through our Lord Jesus Christ. And Israel, you might say, didn't have Jesus. He wasn't born yet. But they had the way. They had Him as their mediator, even though He didn't come yet. Their call was to repent. Their call was to turn in faith and to be accounted as one who is righteous. And that's the same call for you and I today. Prepare to meet our God. Prepare by seeing His holiness, His power, His providence. See, be reminded of who He is and turn from our wicked ways of, of idol worship our evil and, and unrighteous, idolatrous ways. You see, we can, have, we can have services that are set up all the right way. We can have all the right liturgy. We can have all the right words. But if our hearts are far from God, it's all idolatry. Today, too, the cry comes out. It's a gracious call to you and to me. It's a, a kind and compassionate call have faith in Christ Jesus, and to prepare to meet our holy God, the Lord of hosts. It's a kind and compassionate call to Jesus Christ, the mediator, the Messiah, the one who delivers and redeems. You see, God comes today too. He communes with sinners, sinners like you and I. God comes and calls you and me to prepare to meet him. Do so this morning and answer his call in faith and repentance. Amen. Let's pray together. Our great God, our merciful heavenly Father, we come today with boldness into your presence. We, Lord, we, we know that we must rest on the work of our great high priest, Jesus Christ. We know that you've been active, not only in the history of Israel, but in our lives, in our history as well. We can point to events that should have softened our hearts before you, but didn't. Father, forgive us for our, our stiff-necked attitude. We come to you this morning with, with soft hearts. We come with repentance. We come knowing that you are a God of grace. Oh Lord, prepare our hearts to meet you. By working in us through your Spirit, be, be kind, be gracious to us. Send a rich measure, the Holy Spirit, to us this day, that we would be changed, that we would be gathered and drawn into your people, saved by grace through your Son, Jesus Christ. We come confessing your holiness, confessing your majesty and your, your might. We are not worthy, O Lord, to come before you, but that you invite us, but that you call us. We have heard your word. We, we come seeking your favor and your grace, and grant it to us through your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. And, O oh Lord, as we come into your presence and we bring our offerings, our thanksgiving before you, Father, we pray that you would accept these gifts, that you would use them and sanctify them for the pro-life ministry both to, to educate people concerning the rights and the value of the unborn, 
and also, O Lord, to show people the value and the rights of the elderly and the sick, that we might promote life in both stages of life for the young and for the aged. Father, we pray that you would grant within our society an open mind and an open heart to see that the, the gospel message goes out to people who are created in your image, that these little ones are also created in the image of God, that they too ought to be valued and given the rights thereof, the right to life. And so use these gifts, we pray, for that message, that your gospel and the value of your people, of your creation, would be proclaimed far and wide. Father, we also ask that as we go on our special, our each, our, our different ways this afternoon, that you would watch over us too. Gather us once again to praise and worship your holy name this afternoon. Be with the man who brings your word. We ask, O oh Lord, for your blessing today as we indeed come before you. Consecrate our hearts that we might give an offering from a pure heart, not seeking to promote our own ways, but seeking to promote your kingdom, doing so according to your commands. And accept these offerings of thanksgiving, not for what we have done, but for what you have done and what you have called us to do in the name of Christ Jesus. And so we, may we love our neighbor as ourselves. May you work through the giving of the offering as well. We pray these things, O Lord, for your blessing and for the promotion of your kingdom. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We sing a